Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh To carry on with the Human Anatomy Lectures I'm gonna discuss in this presentation an introduction to the Head and Neck course and we will start with the skull I'm Dr. Dalia Saleh, Professor and Head of Anatomy Department at Mansoura University, Egypt The objectives of my presentation will be First, we will know why it is important to study the anatomy of the head and neck and why it is important to study the skull and then we will be familiar with the general features of the skull and compare the adult skull to the fetal skull and finally some applied anatomy points first why it is important to study the anatomy of the head and neck the head and neck region is this region in your body that is packed with small very important structures as it contains the proximal ends of both the respiratory system and also the proximal end of the gastrointestinal system. So we have the nose, the paranasal sinuses, the larynx, which form the upper part of the respiratory tract. And also we have the oral cavity and the pharynx, which form the proximal part of the GIT. Also, the head and neck contains the organs of special senses. So we have the two orbits uh, which contain the eyes or eye globes concerned with vision. Of course, uh, we have the nose. At its roof, there are uh, the olfactory receptors which are responsible for olfaction or smell sensation. Also, we have the two ears and the inner ears uh, contains the uh, organ of corti which uh, are responsible for hearing. And we have the oral cavity which contains the tongue and the tongue carries the taste receptors. So the head and neck is a place for the organs for special senses. Also in the head and neck we have the 12 pairs of cranial nerves that exit uh, the brain and the brain stem. And they have so many functions you will study them during the course of the head and neck. Next, why we study the skull? Uh, the skull is the skeleton of the head and it contains and also protects the brain. All of the cranial nerves you will study in this course and also important blood vessels will pass through openings or foramina uh, which present in the skull. So, Basically, when you study the skull, you should know the names of all of these foramina and the structures that pass through them. Therefore, it is very important before you start studying the head and neck course, you start with the skeleton of the head, which is the skull, because if you know the skull very well, it will be an important tool which will organize uh, the study of the soft tissues uh, within the head and neck. Now let's take a look at the general features of the skull. The skull bones are 22 in numbers and are divided into 8 cranial bones. We call them the neurocranium because when they articulate with each other they will form a case which lodges the brain. And we have another 14 facial bones. We also call them visrocrani. When they articulate with each other, they form cavities which lodges the viscera of the head, like the orbits, the oral cavity, and the nasal cavities, and so on. So uh, in this diagram, you can see the different bones of the skull. This articulated from each other, as we can see in this diagram. You can also see in this diagram that the neurocranium or the part that will lodge the brain is thinner than that of the facial bones. And the thinnest bone will be the parietal bone at the periphery of the skull cap. Let's start first with the neurocranium. The neurocranium or the brain case contains first a cap 
we call it the vault of the skull and uh, this skull cap is formed of bones that covers the brain from above. They are flat bones and develop from a membrane. The highest point at the skull cap is called the vertex. The brain rests on the base of the skull which is formed of a group of bones. They develop from cartilage and they are thicker and harder than that of the vault of the skull. The bones forming the vault of the skull have uh, peculiar features and they differ from uh, the structure of the other bones in our body because they are formed of spongy bone in the middle placed between two plates of compact bones. So this is the spongy bone or cancellous bones present between two plates of dense or compact bone as we can see here. We refer to these bones as the diploid. Some bones of the skull are called pneumatic bones because they contain air cavities within them. They are named the air sinuses. We have frontal sinuses present in the frontal bone. We have the sphenoid air uh, sinuses which present within the sphenoid bone. And we have the ethmoid sinuses present within the ethmoid bone. And finally, uh, maxillary air sinuses which present within the maxilla. As you can see in this diagram, these air sinuses surround the nasal cavity. So we can also call them the nasal air sinuses. As I mentioned, the skull is formed of many bones and these bones articulate with each other with immobile uh, joints or fibrous joints. We call them the skull sutures. So the sutures of the skull are the immovable fibrous joints between the different bones of the skull. We have the coronal suture which uh, lies between the frontal bone and the two parietal bones. We have the sagittal suture which lies between the two parietal bones. And we have the squamous or squamoparietal suture which lies between the squamous part of the temporal bone and the parietal bone as well as the sphenoid bone as well. At the back we have the lambdoid suture which lies between the two parietal bones and the occipital bone. The sutures of the skull meet at certain points. We need to know these uh, points, the names of these points. We have the prigma which is the meeting of the sagittal suture with the coronal suture, the lambda, which is the meeting of the sagittal suture with the lambdoid suture, the terion, which is the point of meeting of four bones, the parietal, the greater wing of sphenoid bone, the frontal, and the squamous part of temporal bone. We also have the astrion, which is a point of meeting of three bones, the occipital, the parietal, and the mastoid bone. At the front, we have the nasion, which is the meeting of the frontonasal and the internasal sutures. And finally, at the back, we have a point, which is not a meeting of sutures, but it is the highest point at the occipital bone. It's called the inion. We describe the bones in certain terminology, so we call the view that we look at the skull and describe it through it, we call it the norm or norma. So you have norma frontalis when you describe the skull from the front. You have norma verticalis when we describe the skull from a vertical view or from above. Norma occipitalis when we describe the skull from behind. It's a rear view of the skull. Norma lateralis. It is the lateral view of the skull. When you uh, start to describe the skull from its lateral view, we call it norma lateralis. And norma pisalis externa. When you describe 
the base of the skull from outside and norma bezalis interna when you describe the skull base from inside or from the cranial cavity uh, view. Uh, for the norma frontalis, um, you can see the shape of the skull. It is almost oval in shape, but its upper part is wider than uh, the lower part. We can divide uh, the norma frontalis into three uh, regions by two lines. The superior part of the fr norma frontalis, formed of the forehead, formed of the frontal bones. The middle part of the norma frontalis contains the two orbits and the nasal cavities and the lower part of the norma frontalis contains the oral cavity. We will mention the details of the norma frontalis later on, probably in another video. In norma verticalis, still it has an oval shape, but the shape of the skull from above differs from one race to another and from one individual to another. It's made of four bones, two parietal bones, frontal and occipital bones. This is the frontal bone, the parietal bone on the left side and the parietal bone on the right side. And this is the occipital bone. And we can see in this norma three sutures, the coronal suture, the sagittal suture and the lambdoid suture. And we can see two points of meeting of these sutures, the pragma and the lambda. So at the anterior end of the sagittal suture, you see the pragma, and at its posterior end, you can see the lambda. In norma occipitalis, or the back view of the skull, as you can see here, we can see four bones, the left and right parietal bones, the occipital bones, the right and left mastoid bones, and these are parts of the temporal bones. We can see the end of the sagittal suture, the lambdoid suture, and the point of meeting of these two, which is the lambda. In normal lateralis, here uh, the skull is seen from the lateral side and it shows three fossae or three depressions. We have the temporal fossa at the side of the skull, beneath the ramus of the mandible and beneath the zygomatic arch. If we just uh, remove them from the view, we have the infratemporal fossa and this red arrow points at its location. And if we remove the mandible and the zygomatic arch, we can see another fossa which is called the trigopalatine fossa. It, it lies uh, posterior to the uh, maxilla between it and the palatine bone here. In norma pizalis externa, we can see the skull from below. And we will study it in details in another video. And we uh, also have the last norma, which is norma bizalis interna, or uh, the floor of the cranial cavity. In this view, you removed the vault of the skull and also the brain, and you can see now the floor of the cranial cavity. We will also study it in a separate video. Now, let's talk a little bit about the fetal skull or the skull of a newborn. The baby skull is not fully ossified, yet leaving soft spots, we call them fontanelles. So if you are looking to the norma verticalis here, you, we can see that the frontal bone is still formed of two uh, halves, two bones, and we have the two parietal bones. And these four bones are not ossified yet, so, and if you remember, I said these bones develop from a membrane. So, the soft spot between these four bones is called the anterior fontanelle, made of fibrous tissue or membrane. Later on, they will be ossified. We call this spot the anterior fontanelle. It closes around two years of age, or one and a half years of age, and 
its trace will be the pregma. So the pregma is the closed anterior fontanelle. At the back, we have a triangular shaped spot called the posterior fontanelle. It closes around the first year of age. It is the space or the place between the two parietal and the occipital bones. And when this spot fully ossifies, it will uh, give us the lambda. At the side of the skull, we have two another soft points, the lateral fontanelles, anterior and posterior. The anterior uh, and posterior one will close uh, soon after birth. So the anterior one will be the place of the terion and the posterior one will be the astrion later on. Some people are born with abnormalities in the skull. I will just mention one which is the scaphocephalia. Occurs due to earlier ossification of the sagittal suture giving us a long and narrow skull. You can relate. Uh, what about skull fractures? As I mentioned before, uh, the skull vault is formed of spongy bones in the middle between two plates of compact bone. We call it the diploid. Fractures of the skull differ a little bit from uh, fractures of the rest of the bones of the body. So we have uh, depressed fractures uh, in the skull. As if you are cracking the skull uh, bones as uh, the shell of the egg and this will lead to compression of the brain. If there is a fracture at the terion, it's very dangerous because uh, behind the terion, uh, within the skull cavity lies the middle meningeal artery which supplies the meninges or the coverings of the brain. And if there is severing of this artery, this will lead to extra dural hemorrhage and collection of the blood uh, outside the dura or the meninges. Also, it will lead to compression of the brain. If there is a fracture at the base of the skull, it is usually fatal, leading to death. It is diagnosed by uh, the presence of black eyes or leak of blood or CSF from the ear or from the nose. Also, skull base fractures will lead to injury of the cranial nerves. This is the end of my presentation. Thanks for listening. If you like it, please do not forget to subscribe, like and share. And do not forget to hit the notification bell so you'll be notified if I upload another video. Thank you.